I'm doing this in case I have an issue. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, that's great. Um, first, I, I want to welcome uh, the, you know, welcome 180 by Wildlife from 80 students to the to here today. Uh, we aren't taking attendance, yay, but I expect you to stay on because there will be quiz questions. And I also like to welcome, there's a, there's a grad class joining us. I see some colleagues from across campus joining us uh, and some other visitors uh, from actually across uh, the United States that are joining us today. So that's great. What, what I'm kind of curious how many participants we got. Let me see. 48, wow. oh, that's great because the class only has 32 students. So 48 participants, that's, that's not bad. Before we get started, I want to, you can see the screen, correct? The PowerPoint yeah. screen with the land acknowledgement. Uh, the University of Montana uh, wants to do an land acknowledgement. The University of Montana acknowledges that we are on the Aboriginal territories of the Chehalis and Kauskau people. Today we honor their path. They have always shown us in caring for this place and the generations to come. Wherever you are in the United States today, you are on Aboriginal territory. Now it is my immense honor to invite Dr. Ambrose Gerald, uh, formerly of NOAA Fisheries and a senior advisor of Woods Hole Partnership Education and uh, the Sea Education Association. He serves on numerous boards. Uh, he earned his PhD uh, from Oklahoma State University and had a 40 year career with NOAA He's still involved and has collaborated with um, the, the um, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. Um, so great career he has, he's had and continues to have. And what else do I wanna say? I'll let him, I'll let Dr. Gerald talk about how we met. I will be leading the slides. Um, and I might give Dr. Gerald a, a, a little push to make sure we keep onto our time limits. So I'll let Dr. Gerald settle in. Okay. Um, hello. Oh. Okay. You can mute, just mute one of them. There we go. That worked, I guess. Oh, you got to unmute yourself now on that one. I was finding with the um, laptop, the Mac, that the um, PowerPoint image is very blurred, but on my desktop here, I can clearly see. Well, so, it, the oh, videos and sounds coming in great. So, uh, so Dr. Um, Gerald, the floor is, is yours. Well, thank you, Aaron, uh, for uh, Dr. Gomez, uh, for inviting me uh, to speak uh, to your class, to us, you know, the Sockness chapter, to your colleagues, and, and further. Uh, so uh, this is an honor, and in particular, that uh, it's an opportunity for me to see success, that you are a professor at the University of Montana. So yay. Because uh, going back to when we first met each other in 2007, uh, when we were both part of the minority striving for higher degrees of success in Earth System Sciences out at the American Geophysical Union meeting in San Francisco, uh, we've both come a long ways, but you've come a mighty long <laughs> way. So uh, thank you uh, and, and, um, and I applaud your accomplishments. And I know that you will be a bright North Star for the University of Montana uh, oh, biology, wildlife biology department <laughs> and for the students there. So, um, and I understand that this is part of uh, celebrating uh, Black History Month um, and, um, and uh, I applaud that. And so much so that I went and I quickly looked up Blacks in Montana there aren't a lot there, but they have been there since the beginning, since the Nebraska-Montana uh, decision, you know, to split or whatever. Uh, you know, York went through there with Lewis and Clark, 
uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but like every place, um, uh, Blacks there uh, have to find a way to live, live peacefully uh, with freedom, liberty, and justice. And while there are not many Blacks in Montana, Montana is one of the 50 states that enjoys all the rights and privileges uh, that come along with being the United States. And so uh, so wanted to get that out there. And, and, and also that um, this being Black History Month week, uh, um, month, um, uh, today is the birthday of W. Du Bois. And W. Du Bois is a very uh, a world renowned and named, uh, 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 I would say, global treasure. And uh, he was the one who brought us the concept of the color line, the problem of the color line in America. And, and he was the first uh, African American to receive a doctorate from Harvard University. And then Black History Month, um, which was founded, or the father of, is contributed to Carter G. Woodson. And he was the uh, second um, African American to follow uh, W.E. Du Bois to get a, a, a doctorate from Harvard University. So a little bit of black history there. <laughs> but uh, our uh, reason for being here, and that is to talk with uh, you and your colleagues, your students, and, and everyone else who's joined us about the uh, you know, envisioning diversity uh, in um, science uh, conservation and, and what have you. Um, so, um, Aram, uh, I think that we can, um, uh, let me go quickly back to that first slide, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so I was gonna say this photograph of me here is a probably a eight years ago photograph of me. As you can see now, I've lost a lot more hair, a lot grayer. And that's me standing in front of the, uh, the Biglow, uh, Henry uh, Biglow uh, research vessel, the NOAA research vessel. Uh, and I spent um, uh, close to 40 years of my life uh, as a uh, marine biologist or a fishery scientist at NOAA Fisheries in Woods Hole. So I'll go from there. Next slide, please. This here uh, is a, a map uh, that I participated in constructing as one of the national science projects at the time uh, when looking at diversity and tracing one's uh, uh, history and all of the uh, impinging, uh, you know, uh, life uh, experiences that, uh, you know, help to shape us who we are. And, and so in the light of diversity, we all come with our God-given talents, uh, who we are, and no one can take that away from us, but we all deserve a place in the sun, so to say, to be able to follow our hopes, dreams, and aspirations, and should not be limited by any factors, including skin color. And so um, I was born in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, shortly after that, um, I found myself on my uh, father's family's uh, farm in North Carolina. Uh, at the time, it was some, um, maybe compared to Montana, not very big, but it was a 500 and some acre farm that included both uh, uh, farmland and, 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 um, and woodland. And the woodland was larger than the farm component. The cash crop was tobacco at that time. And so, uh, I grew up on a farm that had a pond on it. Uh, it had a little stream next to it, or what we would call a swamp. And, and, um, and it had lots of ditches. And it had a, sort of a flooded area uh, was associated with Juniper Bay. We were down in that southeast corner of North Carolina, uh, where we have the cypress, uh, we have the Spanish moss, uh, we uh, have some of the uh, vegetation that you might find that makes its way all the way up from Florida, so to say. Uh, we could even grow sugar cane there. So a little bit about there and growing up on my family farm as an only child until I was just about 12 years old. And my dad's, so I lived with my grandmother, my grandfather died 
and my dad's younger sisters and brothers who were all some still in college, but some just haven't finished college and were teaching in the area. Uh, and then, um, you know, I made my way back to where I was born, Annapolis, Maryland, and did um, my, um, um, you know, second, secondary schooling there and then off to college uh, to University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. At that time was Maryland State College. And there were a lot of influences on the, the church, the YMCA. Uh, I worked at and around the General Hospital. Uh, and, and, and I got the Frontiers of America Award for Leadership, uh, and that was a big deal, you know, made the newspaper. And, and so, uh, you know, kid then off to college, and then off to the University of Maryland Eastern Shore where I majored in biology, minored in chemistry, and almost had a double major, one course short of, uh, of, of a major in chemistry as well. Ended up, long story, but uh, working in Philadelphia as a chemist uh, at, at Public Industries. Uh, and I worked as a, a company chemist, uh, as opposed to a union chemist, which I was on the experimental side of things. Uh, and then I got this call, hey, um, we know you have always been interested in graduate school, you applied, uh, you had to not to, um, you had to make a decision to go or not to go. So needed to make money to help with my sister who would just graduated from high school. My brother would be graduating the next year. Then I had another one be graduating a couple of years after that. So I worked a little bit to help get her going, my brother, et cetera. And then got this call and took, heeded the um, call that my, one of my math professors and one of my biological science professors had told me about and had met this fellow, Brad Brown, who was looking to uh, uh, populate the uh, newly uh, established uh, fish and wildlife or, or cooperative fishery unit at Oklahoma State University. And so um, I talked about it. I gave up this good paying job to go to Oklahoma, sight unseen, uh, to uh, participate uh, as a graduate student with a full ride, a research assistant in the cooperative fishery unit there. That was a wonderful experience. It was a challenging experience. And there was a lot about race and about culture and about uh, what have you that I had to withstand and stand my ground on, uh, but not let it deter me from what I was there for. But I also met some wonderful people there who helped get me through that. And my uh, advisor, uh, and a few of the other uh, faculty members there and my cohorts uh, were very instrumental in my being as fully integrated into what was going on there as possible as far as a life experience and academic and research experience. And, but it was not without its challenges. And, and, and so, but um, I had some good people who were there to help as best they could under those very harsh times in many ways back in 1967. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, when I left Philadelphia and Annapolis, people were wondering, do you need your head examined to leave here and go out to Oklahoma? But I did. And some of those people today are still my best friends uh, and, and better friends. And we still exchange Christmas cards. So been off to, um, got drafted in the uh, army, then off to after that, uh, that was during the Vietnam era, then off after that, back to Oklahoma State University, picked up my PhD, uh, and then um, left there to teach at uh, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania uh, as an assistant professor, uh, and then from there, Howard University as an assistant professor in biology, and, and zoology, I'm sorry, and then from Howard University, both historically Black colleges and universities, and then to uh, the uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center, uh, where I started out as chief of the fishery biology investigation, uh, which handled all of the production age determination work on, uh, for the, um, the uh, National Marine Fishery Service, part of the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. So I spent uh, my uh, career uh, from there until I retired in 2016. So, um, and, but through all of these experiences as we go through this, uh, we had to, I had to contend with the fact that 
I'm living and working and breathing still in a space where uh, there is not total freedom and, and liberty for one of my hue. Uh, so you had to uh, meet the challenges. Next, Dr. Aaron. These are just some photographs uh, from earlier days uh, when I was at Oklahoma State or, or around that time. And, you know, here I am up here, uh, you know, would be the scuba dive, I mean, the, you know, the diver or whatever, uh, in the farm pond of uh, this fellow here in the middle of these three individuals, the fellow on the right in the gray jacket, that's Ron Boyer, that's my very good dear friend, we're still good friends, he's back uh, uh, taking care of the family farm in Fredonia, Kansas, in the middle is Bob Tapinelody, still a very dear friend, retired from, um, from uh, New Mexico State University and fisheries there, and of course that's me on the left, uh, I'm here uh, pretending that I know something about what's happening with this outboard motor while Paul Mark is in the back uh, probably taking care of a shared pin or something. And here I'm with a, a, you know, a trap, barrel trap, and, and, and here a little leisure with uh, fishing. But they, and then up in the corner, that was a trip that when I was in the Army, uh, I took my leave time and jo joined Bob Tefanelli, and we started out from... Um, uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma, I flew there and then drove in his Toyota all the way to the uh, Pacific Ocean. And we came through, went through Montana, my first time ever there. And this picture here is somewhere in Mount, uh, near Mount Rainier, as I recall. Um, uh, next, please. Uh, and, and this is part of my path to getting and, and being here at graduate school uh, at Oklahoma State University, where, as I said, I earned my um, um, master's degree in a classical fisheries biology program. Um, and, and then I followed that uh, with a little hiatus with the uh, Army and uh, worked on my, uh, and, and, and earned my um, uh, uh, PhD. And while working on my master's degree, one of the things I want to say is that uh, there was a tension uh, that had to be given to purposefully uh, when we were out on field trips often, whether it, I was part of an ichthyology class, whether I was part of a limnology class, uh, a wildlife class, whether we were on a um, just an exposition to go out as part of the uh, Oklahoma Cooperative uh, or Oklahoma um, uh, Academy of Science. Uh, a field trip or whatever, or I was going to a, uh, traveling to get to a, a conference, uh, I had to be concerned about my safety as a black uh, man. Uh, even, and even though I was a, surrounded by friends, people who had me in their best interest to help look out for me, but often they had not had to deal with what would it take uh, for me to, tra to traverse, for example, from Stillwater, Oklahoma, to New Orleans for an American Society and Fish and Wildlife, um, uh, there was a games commission meeting that was being held there. And my safety in getting there at the time as a black person, while things were still in many ways segregated, legally segregated, um, and, and well, not legally, but they held on to the segregation. So I couldn't go into the restaurants and eat. Uh, uh, so my food had to be brought out to me. Uh, um, and, and because I wasn't welcome, you see. And then getting to New Orleans and, and uh, the governor spending the first, you know, few minutes welcoming people to the meeting and then going into a tirade about what he'd do if Rap Brown and Stokely Mal Carmichael came to Louisiana. They were very outspoken blacks at the time about integration and segregation and what have you. And, and I was the only black attending that meeting. Uh, and, and so, I, so I, I say that, that um, for those who are black, brown, and biops, uh, that sitting here in the land of the Wampanoax, uh, I say to you that those are consciousnesses that the faculty and those planning uh, trips or, or, exp or, or learning experiences must have in mind is the safety of those persons with you. And even if it's not spoken, do not assume that those persons 
are not concerned about how they are viewed and seen and how that's impacting them being able to fully uh, pay attention to the lesson or the object of why you're on that field trip of, or of the, the class and doing well and getting that A in the class because you completed all experiments, okay? So I'll say that. Why don't we move on, Aaron? So uh, at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, what I did in terms of my career, my trajectory, uh, was I had listened to those people who were my mentors in my corner met me well. So I followed my, my MS, my master's degree mentor, uh, Dr. Brown, uh, to Woods Hole. And that's where I became chief of the research, uh, uh, you know, it's assessment to uh, fishery, but it was really uh, the fisheries biology investigation in the research, uh, uh, research assessment division. We had the population dynamics. As I said, I handled the fish, uh, aging growth uh, the fecundity, um, uh, the uh, reproductive work, and a little bit of behavior stuff that I was interested in. But the point I want to make here is there were so many of how did he get that job? Why did he get that job? Does he deserve that job? Well, I had been trained and earned my degrees and played by the rules, worked very hard like everybody else. Dr. Brown said, yes, he made the personal decision to hire me. And that's what has to happen in every situation. Someone has to make the personal decision to hire someone. And right now we still have a problem with those in power and authority to, to uh, hire, to uh, want to uh, make the hard decision and hire someone and, and not be afraid of their capital, their human capital or their friendship if they hire somebody from a, from the non-dominant culture, for example. So that, that um, so my mentor insisted, uh, uh, you know, that I was qualified. Um, I did meet with resistance, uh, both from peers and superior, uh, superiors who didn't understand that I had to earn my degree and my way there and had to have published in order to qualify to for the register to get that federal job. You couldn't just get it. You had to meet all of the qualifications. So that's the only way I could get the job. Uh, and so they were pushing back on their understanding notion of affirmative action. So I wasn't there as a scientist the way they were in many ways. I was there because I had some special treatment never thinking about that they had had special treatment uh, or those before them since the beginning of this country. And that was a special treatment to keep people like me in our place or from even being educated or in, being in their space. And, and so, but that's, I don't want to get too ugly here, but never, or talk about the underbelly. Uh, but nevertheless, I had to deal with those. Uh, and you win some battles and you lose some. And you hope that in gaining wisdom and understanding that you learn to choose, know when to hold and when to fold, so to say, okay? And, um, and then I, I, I uh, worked through the system and honored the system. And so I had to know what it meant to uh, publish or perish. And, and it was that, that uh, why I was able to get that job because uh, prior to going to Woods Hole, in addition to the publications from my master's level, my PhD level, I had gone out to a quasi um, a postdoc position to uh, uh, Berkeley University and Livermore lab and had worked on anchovy egg and larvae uh, from, collected from uh, Raccoon Strait uh, on the San Francisco Bay, just there between Sausalito and the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And, and I spent a great time out there and working at Diablo Canyon, got down to the Salton Sea, uh, and and uh, had those experiences. And, and so I was qualified. So why don't we go to the next, please? Next. Uh, here, uh, in addition to being qualified, in addition to taking um, on um, uh, your work, your professional life, uh, your passion for what you wanna do, whether it's in wildlife or whatever, there are those that support you. And I've said a little bit about those persons in the academy or in the research sphere that were my supporters 
uh, as a juxtaposition to those who were my detractors. Well, this is my family here. And my wife looked at this just before uh, I got on. And she says, oh, where's Asa? Uh, and uh, I think um, somehow I cut off Asa. That's his wife uh, there in the orange outfit. That's Kelly, my daughter-in-law. And so my son is not there. He would have been right there. Handsome young man. That's my daughter, Saba. Me, uh, then my wife, Anna. And then that's my son-in-law, Mark. And this is the love of our life right now and keeps us going is my three plus year old daughter, uh, granddaughter, Taya. And, and, uh, and then down here, I just threw this in because we developed a relationship. This is the late um, congressional member, uh, Elijah Cummings from uh, Maryland. And at the time I was a trustee at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. And of course, being really one of the only black folks there, like Dr. Uh, Gomez is there in his department, I was tapped to make sure that our bird dog, uh, 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 Mr. Congressman uh, um, Cum Cummings, all day and make him feel welcome and just whatever, you know. But I, I, I love the opportunity. And, and, uh, and so I, I threw it in that for good measure. But uh, what it is, I want to say here, there has to be this balance between your work and family and your life and, and, and what, what makes you happy also. Uh, and your culture is extremely important and you have to honor your, your foreparents and grandparents and, 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 and what have you, uh, all the hard sacrifices that they made. Um, uh, next, please. And so uh, surviving, I've, I've already uh, talked about, that's my son. Uh, I've already uh, talked about uh, this to some degree, survival, growth, and professional development. Uh, it is important uh, that you try to not let uh, those negative elements around you, people or incidents or whatever, uh, throw you off guard know what it is you are after, work very hard, diligently, be accountable, uh, have, have uh, tenacity and, and veracity, truthfulness about yourself, be resilient and find ways to pick up and keep going. And that's often calling on your family, friends, uh, your mentors, your, your professors or, or whomever uh, to help you uh, lick your wounds and pick up and keep going. Uh, and, 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 and that is my uh, advice to young people. And that is be an advocate for yourself. When I met Iram, Iram probably remembers, I talked uh, a lot about advocating for yourself. You have a responsibility uh, to uh, reach your goals as much as those who are there to help you and to overcome those who would uh, thwart you from reaching your goals. And, but you do that through advocating for yourself, carrying yourself in a way that you respect and love yourself and you can see respect and dignity in others. And then uh, play by the rules. And, and uh, you, you've got to play within the rules as much as sometimes we know some rules are not good rules. But if we get a chance, we help change those rules. But at the time you try to play within the rules so that you can uh, play uh, you know, uh, play uh, by the rules and because and, rules do change and the game changes, but you want to be one that's known that uh, you, if you, if you are met with a situation of being questioned, it isn't because you didn't play by the rules. Okay. And, and know your craft and take advantage of opportunities. Much of my life and where I am now has to do with serendipity. I was at the right place at the right time. Those people who knew me, thought a lot of me, or had some inkling about me, told me what line to stand in, uh, where there was an opportunity, and said that they would then uh, vouch for me. And that's important, having those who will vouch for you. So spend some time with your mentors, with your advisor, with your faculty, helping them to get to know who you are and what it is you would like to do. Uh, and that way, when it's time for them to write a letter of recommendation, they can spell you, they can speak well of you, 
and not get into a psychoanalysis in saying, but, but, but. You want someone who can stand in your corner. Um, and work uh, with diversity, equity, inclusion. It's important that you see the world around you and that you see the, the, uh, the diversity in all its nature. And, and so uh, that means people as well, not just the critters that you're working with or the flora and the fauna, <laughs> but it's the, the people that you work with and people, and we need to lift humanity up. And we have a lot of craziness going on in the world right now. And these have been some harsh four to five years we've had to live through. And, and, and they've been scary and they're still scary, but uh, we've got to find a way to know that there is value in every human being and that no one should be given uh, more than the other simply because of uh, the skin, of the, the color of their skin, okay? Next. So the, these are questions that I had uh, for you, if you feel comfortable asking or okay. addressing them. First mm -hmm. is, how is I as a professor and for my colleagues that aren't uh, professors of color, uh, help diversify and empower our students in academia and conservation, generally speaking? Well, I, I think, uh, Dr. Gomez, that uh, professors um, have the responsibility to be comfortable with themselves, to know themselves, and to know themselves well enough that they are not threatened by a student, a colleague, or anyone else, whether it's at a sock nest meeting or it's, a, it's at the, the wildlife meeting or fisheries meeting. Uh, when they come into contact with someone from a different culture, a different background, uh, that they cannot have a real, honest, authentic conversation with and meet them where they are and go from there around their common interests and they'll see the similarities rather than dwell on the differences. And I think uh, professors can help by making sure that they are conversant and that they are as culturally aware of differences uh, so that when they're offering information that may be void of information about populations, for example, that are not included and historically haven't been included in lessons or in history or in whatever it is, that they have a way that they can bring that in there so that those students can feel uh, uh, comfortable also. I think they have to get to know uh, the students on their campus, for example, so that the kids of color or the bio uh, uh, young people are not just there taking courses, that they're not invisible. They must be visible. They need to take the time to reach out to them, to know those students so that those students can come to them for a letter of recommendation. They need to find ways to help those students build their uh, communication skills uh, in presenting so that they can go to conferences and present and play by the rules of publish or perish. Uh, et cetera, and doing well and building skills. So those, those kinds of things I think are very important. So you, you kind of touched on this, but one, I'm one that I'm kind of really curious about, and I know our students are, is how did you persevere? Because obviously, I mean, it's hard nowadays for students of color and conservation of color and scientists of color to navigate uh, this profession. But I mean, you were navigating this 40, 50 years ago. How did you just keep at it? How did you persevere? Well, I think again, I was a lucky young man to uh, have been raised, saved the way I was on my family farm. Excuse my crossness, but I grew up on a farm where they knew they had to get the, cra the cash crop to market. That was tobacco. Then there was some corn, cotton, then there was some livestock, mostly swine and what have you. Uh, a little dabbled a little bit in fowl, sometimes chickens. But 
the staying on the farm that I grew up, my dad's uh, brothers and sisters and the community was the sun didn't rise and shine on anybody's asses but ours, okay? So that meant we had to get out there and get the crop there. And it meant you had to be able to challenge the folks at the auction place in Fairmont when you had white farmers there who wanted thinking because you're black, they can shove you aside and they can jump in line in front of you, you know, and et cetera. So you had to assert you. So I'm saying I came out of that environment where you knew you work hard, you studied hard, you played hard, and you look to be rewarded and fairly rewarded for it. And so I believe that I came up with the experiences I had in Carolina and then mo moving to a little, uh, back to a little colonial town like Annapolis, Maryland, where there was about 14,000 people there then. And I had all the fun of uh, crabbing and around the water's edge, you know, the, the Severn River or off of the Chesapeake Bay there. And, and but learning about those invisible fences uh, where blacks could go and not go comfortably and this sort of thing. But I had to learn to negotiate, but I had people helping me to negotiate those things. And then um, it, I had to rely a lot from my point of view on my faith. Uh, I prayed a lot <laughs> in situations, uh, but, um, and then uh, I had uh, to listen to those who were mentoring me, even if they didn't have all the answers or they hadn't had the experience, they knew the system that they were successful in. Here's how you play it. Here's how you do it. Uh, I'm here, I have your back. Those things were very instrumental. Uh, and, and, and so I think those are the kinds of things. So mentorship, that, I'm hearing there's a theme is that finding good mentors. And is, I'm gonna guess that many of your mentors you found mentors that weren't good and you switched or you just relied on the mentors that did empower you and did believe exactly. in you. Exactly. And my mentors, you're in a place like the University of Montana. I was looking at your stats for the state and for the university. You don't have a lot of people there of color in many ways. Well, when I went to Oklahoma State University, I was the only black in the uh, zoology department, the biology department, in science there uh, for a good while. Uh, who was it? Clarence and two others showed up later before I graduated. So I have always been, uh, or for a good portion of my life after I met, left, uh, you know, my undergraduate institution, which I came through a period of legal segregation in this country where the law said blacks and whites could not go to school together in the South, in, you know, in the Confederate States. Uh, and, and so, uh, uh, so, what I'm saying to you is when I hit graduate school and when I worked as a chemist uh, and uh, then at it, 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 it Woods Hole for you know, those 30 some years, I was often the only one. So my mentors were white folks, you know? Uh, so I had to be able to find out, well, who are these white folks that really are good human beings and are decent human beings and really have my back? And me and you know their best interests, you know, or me and you know, so so it's those kinds of things. You you have to be able to be sagacious about your company that you keep, you see, and and uh, and and so that, that that's very important, I think. How, how can we also we have you know, our students here? They're going to be future uh, Forest Service chiefs. They're going to be district biologists, state leaders of state agencies. Eventually, they'll be heads of nonprofits. We'll have future professors. We have some professors here. They might be deans and chairs. How collectively, whether you're a person of color or not, um, how can we help diversify science, generally speaking? Because as you know, one of the reasons you know, we're starting SACNAS is to empower these, uh, our students of color in sciences, um, but we're underrepresented. And so how, regardless of your background, how can you empower uh, diversity in the sciences? Well, I think you do that by first and foremost, understanding history and taking the time to look uh, at um, history. Uh, for example, uh, we can't go deeply into this, but when we're looking at diversity, inclusion and equity and welcoming, this is kind of new still. When I first started out, 
we were talking about equal opportunity. And equal opportunity was coming into the language around World War II, when Truman and others were pressed to let Mexican Americans, Black Americans, uh, Puerto Ricans, uh, you name it, into the military, you see. And then they came up with this equal opportunity, you see. And, and then a, a signature and, and monumental milestone was the Brown versus Board of Education. Brown versus Board of Education tore down the legal, by law, segregation in our education systems. K through 12, academia. They had to open the doors to everyone. They could no longer say blacks can not go here. Uh, even though at one time blacks uh, early on in some of the Northern and Western states, a few could go. Uh, and, but often even there, they had to sit in the hallway. They couldn't sit in the classroom with the white students or the professor. So Brown versus Board of Education and then the Civil Rights Act laws in the 60s. We have to look at all these. Black, brown, biop people and women have had to have acts and amendments for their freedom, their liberty, their access. And so this is very important and education was very part of that because uh, now, so what we have to do is we have to find ways that we make sure that we are not using false gatekeeping metrics, metrics to keep people from biop communities out of entering science, following their curiosity, their aspiration, their dreams, and their interests and their desires. And, and when they get to us at the, um, at, at the academy, for example, we've got to make sure that we treat them fairly. And that also means being concerned about their social welfare there, not just their academic welfare, because you're not going to do it well if socially you are threatened or you're not comfortable. So the quality of life, campus life, climate and life has to be conducive to of uh, safety, not feeling fearful that some fools are gonna come and, and accost you uh, because of uh, assault you because of the color of your skin or your gender or your sexuality or whatever, or, or, or what have you. And then uh, uh, the, uh, we have to find ways for places like the University of Montana to reach out to, um, if it is not a, uh, a minority serving institution, uh, where there are strong populations of Latinx individuals or strong populations of Blacks, the historically Black colleges and universities, the tribal colleges. We have to be respectful of these institutions, that they are accredited institutions with people who, there, who have expertise uh, in areas of teaching, learning, and training that they could bring to the, uh, the, 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 that space that's at the University of Montana on how to meet people and, and draw the best out of them and, and, and uh, not continue this uh, parental supremacy model of we the flagship university, or we the Ivy League or the small well Hill finance uh, small college, we are the cat's meow, you see. You gotta come to us. It's about time these institutions realize they need to lock arms and form with these other institutions that have been making uh, milk out of flour for a long time. And, and so we've got to also be active in our professional and scientific organizations uh, and, and, and bring to bear at those spaces, uh, their being able to collaborate or our being able to collaborate with the, the, the scientific and learned organizations with the minority serving institutions, with other institutions of higher education that have maybe have best practices that may be better than ours. We've got to have a true collaborative uh, approach to addressing this problem of systemic racism, structural racism, white supremacy, uh, 
and that's how you're going to do it. Uh, Thank you very much. So just we'll we'll stay on to okay. the end of the we'll stay on to the end of the hour. Uh, uh -huh. so, so we've got 13 minutes, but I know some of my students might have to leave for another class. I'll put this recording up. We did not take attendance. We'll still stay on for a few more minutes. I before we get into like public questions, um, I I want to say that we are starting a SACNAS. We've started a SACNAS or a group here on campus. If you are interested. I will put this code on the chat um, so you can sign up. Our next event is next Wednesday, not next Wednesday, a Wednesday uh, week from tomorrow. Um, you can use the code to sign up to get emails and find out more information about it. Uh, Dr. Gerald, you had a thought before we move on to student questions? Well, the one thing I would start to say, Dr. Remitz, is um, I have a book here uh, and the title of the book is Black Nature, Four Centuries of African-American Nature Poetry. And I raised this, so it's just Black History Week and, and month. And, and in the light that um, we, in addition to our science in becoming culturally competent and aware, there are other ways that we can look out uh, to, um, uh, enlighten ourselves uh, in uh, how we then go about uh, diversifying the sciences. And um, I just want to read one little thing here from uh, Lucille uh, Clifton, uh, a little poem, and it's, the earth is a living thing. It is a black shambling bear, ruffling its wild back and tossing mountains into the sea. Is a Black hawk circling the burying ground, circling the bones, picked clean and discarded. Is a fish, black blind in the belly of water. Is a diamond blind in the black belly of coal. Is a black and living thing. Is a favorite child of the universe. Feel her rolling her hand in its kinky hair, feel her brushing it clean. I just want to leave you with the poem from Black Nature, Four That's Centuries of African-American um, Nature Poetry. Thank you, I'll, put, I'll, I'll mention that on our social media page. So you have Facebook and Instagram. So if you find UM Saknas, look for it. Um, we had a question from uh, Jake. I'll let Jake introduce himself. He had a question he wanted to ask you. I was actually thinking the same thing, wondering the same thing. Uh, Dr. Gerald, I am a um, master's student in our Department of Society and Conservation here at the University of Montana and uh, something I've been struggling with personally and I was hoping that maybe you could give uh, some insight towards uh, as, um, as we move from kind of a discourse around equal opportunity to the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, as, I don't know, as BIPOC conservationists, scientists, uh, should we continue to strive to act uh, within the system or at what point do we strive to change it? So, uh, thank you, Jake, for that question. And the church is, the, the question is, should you continue to act within the system or what? Or work to change it. Okay. Yes. Uh, great question. Uh, and I would say that you need to do both. And this isn't a cop out. And what I'm getting at here is first and foremost, understand the system that you are in. And you're not going to give up on it and then go work on it. You're going to understand it and you're going to work in it. You're going to give people an opportunity to hear you and to try to come to reasonableness. And in doing so, I believe you're then building a collaborative approach. And collaboration is about changing the rules together. It isn't a power thing where one gets to say, this is what we do as a collaborative, uh, and then you either come in or not. Uh, no, it's, a, it, it's, it's a, uh, a, a relationship of where you work together 
on changing the rules and finding the resources and, and all that is needed to get to where you have now uh, defined a common objective or goal or aim that you're after. And so you can go at it that way, I believe. And of course, if you're not working with reasonableness, then you do sometimes have to take on bold steps uh, and, and, and do dramatic things to bring attention to what is not working, okay? I'm gonna, if I, don't, if I can add to that, I, uh, I, for 10 years, I was advisor of the largest Latino student organization in the state of Washington for, for college students at Washington State University. It was the biggest college student organization, Latino college student organization in the entire state of Washington. And I told my students, do you wanna be self-righteous or do you wanna get things done? It's not fair that students of color, that people of color, the BIPOC people have to fight these battles. It's not fair that we have to be patient. It's not fair that we have to be set careful with our words. None of that is fair. But sometimes when I work with these, you know, certain groups, I'm like, do we want to change the system or do we want to just be upset about it, right? It's not fair. And, and sometimes you're going to be upset about it. Sometimes you're, you need to, you know, you know, raise a little fuss about some things, point out some things. But I know in my career and, and, working in the university structure and the nonprofit world is that I've gotten more done by calling people in than calling people out. And it's not fair. I'll put it up there. It's not fair that we have to be the ones that have to be sensitive to the dominant culture. It's not fair that we have to be sensitive to like how we phrase things, right? Um, but my goal is to get things done and change. And so I would side on calling people in when possible. It's, when, that, that's gonna change depending on who you are, uh, what position you are. Obviously, when you get into those positions of power, you're gonna have more of a say and you're gonna be able to call people in more and people will listen and you'll be able to set the tone for your organization. Um, wherever you are in your career, if you're a college freshman, a grad student, a professor, there's someone that wants to be in your shoes the stream is to be in your shoes. And so you can empower uh, those students and those people. Uh, do we have, we have uh, five minutes for questions still left. If you have questions, can you put them in the chat and I'll call on you. Um, any of my 180 students can unmute themselves and just ask a question right now, if you're still on. There might be enough of us. If you want to unmute your, it is now open to anybody. If you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, you're welcome to. Well, I will say too, while we're waiting to Jake's question too, to expand a little more on that too, is one of the issues we're dealing with, I believe, is the status quo and what we are trying to find a way forward is, is that our embracing a, a way forward that we are not continuing to enable the status quo to be accepted. And so I think what we're after really is changing the status quo because the status quo has meant that we must know our place you see, and, and quietly, uh, and, and, and you can maybe be invited to the party or to whatever's going on. Uh, and, and, and what we've got to get to the point is that we've got to be part of planning the party and, and not being a polite guest, just a polite guest at the party, you see, if that's making sense. Yeah, yeah, and, that's and, a, yeah you don't want to, that's why we start moving, you know, from equal opportunity to from diversity to moving to inclusion, right? Because yeah. really where you're in the, you're not just at the table, but you're making, you're having a question. Yeah. Um, Dr. Green uh, here in the wildlife program, the professor has a comment or question he'd like to add. Yes, first of all, thank you very much, Dr. Gerald. Um, really, really great and moving um, perspective and, just to hear your personal story um, and, and your perspective and advice is, is really powerful and inspirational. So thank you. And 
I just wanted uh, to respond a little bit, Jake, to you, to your um, question, which was really good. And I'm going to offer my perspective um, from an old white guy, okay? And so you, you asked about, you know, should we try to live in the system or change it? And I guess what I would say is that, and I've been wrestling and thinking about these issues for a long time, is that by <clears throat> being part of the system, you are changing the system. And so, for example, um, you know, people like me can talk all we want about diversity and equity and inclusion, but I got to say, we hired Areem less than a, a year ago, and my God, this, this campus has already changed so much because of Areem's presence and his perspective and his network and his connections. And so I would say by, by you know, it's, and I know it's, incredibly frustrating, um, but by being part of the system, um, and as Dr. Gerald pointed out, by understanding how it works and figuring out um, how to navigate it, but being part of the system, you are, you will make profound changes in it as it gets more diverse. I guess that's just what I'd like to offer from, from an old white guy is that I can say that Areem has changed this campus um, a lot in the short time he's been here. And I, and I appreciate the, the recent promotion to the a tenure track assistant professor. So that was, that was, that was great. <laughs> um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Gerald, I'll, we have about one minute left. I'll just, uh, anything, last thoughts you have uh, for the first year wildlife students as they move on through their career? Any advice, professional advice or advice as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Uh, I, I, I think, uh, Dr. Gomez, what I would say is to my son and daughter, my granddaughter, whomever, is work hard, study hard, build your skills, uh, play. Uh, don't forget to learn how to have fun, to love, and be respectful of others and, th and this good earth that we're on. And, and, and keep in your heart and mind that uh, you're there not just for yourself, but the better of humanity. So you're doing all this also to be how you can contribute uh, to, you know, our quality of life and the generations to come. But, but work very hard, study hard, uh, but advocate for yourself and, and study. And, and, and I don't know what more I can say to yeah. that. And, and never forget who you are and from where you come from. Your ancestors bled, sweat, and cried a lot for you to be here where you are. So don't forget them, okay? Thank you very much. We'll do a virtual. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gerald, I'll give you a call later on this afternoon, evening. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. I, I enjoyed it. It, it was fun. Well, I'm gonna invite you back next year, just so you know. This All right, I'm, I'm ready if, yep, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Take care. I'll stay on if anyone has questions about sock mass or anything for, for a minute or two. Thank you, Eric, for coming. I really appreciate it. It was nice to have some faculty in there. Chad was in there. Um, so it was great. I don't know if you're talking, Eric, but I can't because it's green, but I can't see you or hear you. Well, thank you, everyone.